gotta jump right in to the XFL, baby. Year one with Jim Monis uh, near the top of that masthead is in the books. I gotta say that championship was a hell of a lot of fun. Enjoyed watching it. I really hope the NFL is gonna take a lot of the features that you guys introduced to the sport and implement them from the fourth and long instead of the onside kick. I mean, the onside kick is about as boring as it gets at this point. And the NFL, we just assume that the team's going to recover yeah, it's it. Pointless. Uh, that, it's pointless. It's pointless. Um, the one-point play, the two-point play, the three-point play, it, it extends the game. It makes it an exciting product. And I, I got to say, it was fun to watch. There, there were some familiar names, some names. I never heard of Perez, the quarterback. Arlington and, and he was fun to watch and it was just a it, it was a great championship game I love the fact that a four and six team gets in wins the semis wins the championship it, it kind of is emblematic of everything that you guys really wanted out of the XFL well what was cool about uh, thanks Tyler for the support and and talking about the XFL a little bit because it does feel good for the players the coaches all the staff that's been in Arlington getting this thing off the ground for the last year and a half two years Finishing it, it feels good. But now, you know, it's only going to get better. And that's what you take from year one. Learn from it, whatever we can make improvements on. But the good stuff is we have players sign into the NFL. And that's what the goal of this league was, for guys to continue to get opportunities. And for the guys that don't, it's still get a way to get paid and play football. So really was cool. Perez, the quarterback for Arlington that won it real quick. I've been around him a lot over the years. When I started in the AAF back in like 2018, 19 that year he was in that league then he went to the AAF then he went to the XFL in 2020 COVID shut that down so he gets another opportunity he gets traded halfway through the season to Arlington and that's why they were they had a four and six record but they only got Perez in week seven and we all know what the quarterbacks make a difference they had a good defense all year they just needed to get the right guy quarterback and there it is so they played – if you paid attention to the XFL, you knew that Arlington was a good team. Obviously, you have a Bob Stoops as the coach, Perez as a quarterback that knows how to play in these leagues, and it made the difference. For, bottom line is it was a great season. D.C. had a great year. They, were, they, they didn't win it. They're probably miserable right now like we all would be. But, man, the competition was good. The talent was good. So only can get better. But thanks, Tyler, for bringing it up. It, it felt good to see. It, it was – I think a casual fan flipping through the channels, looking for something to do on a Saturday night, Sunday day, it, you would see these games come across and, and stop what you're doing to watch. I, I know that uh, I was trying to put Bluey on hold as much as I could with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> come on, Ella. We, I, I know yeah. I know the show's great, but we, we got to see what Arlington's up to. We got to, we, we got to watch a little uh, Seattle sea dragons act with Ben DiNucci, which hey. Ben DiNucci Going to the Denver Sean Broncos, Payton Sean Payton wants to take a chance on him. That's pretty cool. Well, that's great. Congratulations and looking for the league goes to the sport. Um, we should say here at the top, Fatty Beer Company always fuels the podcast. And, man, we had a fun time at the live event ahead of the NFL draft. So I know we want to do some more of those. Uh, we'll be there in person at some point this week. So we'll yeah let you know. Um and yeah, Orchard Park, Hamburg. I think they're opening up a spot in Lancaster now. Uh, Nick and Chris are all over the place. So grab your sours. It's sour season in my book. I, I think that's the route to go. Uh, the weather's nice here. What do you think, Jim? What, what's your I'm summer sure beer? Has whatever, I know one thing. They have whatever you're in the mood for. That's one thing we've seen. And that and those refrigerators, it can, you know, you go over to those refrigerators, it's like you better know what you want because they have everything. I know you've got the uh, HOA over there where, where you're living. I got to say, it was it's mowing season. As a, as a middle-aged man, as a washed-up middle-aged man, it's, what you look forward to is mowing that lawn on Saturday morning. And, you know, it used to be the, the post-mow beer. If you're careful, I think you can go with a mid-mow beer. I think that's, oh, yeah. that's okay. You know, de- depending on the terrain, right, you know, want to be you know working those 45 degree side hills when you're uh, a beer and a half deep but i, I gotta say those sours at fatty they they go well with the mid mowing 
Uh, it also hit me, Jim. <laughs> it, like the highest form of competition now at, at my age, 35 going on 36. And, you know, we both played the high school sports and God, I mean, even, even beyond that at Syracuse, God, the uh, inter, inter Merrill's were amazing and highly competitive. And we had a basketball league in green Bay when I lived out there. Like I, I wasn't completely washed up yet into the, the mid to late twenties, you know, played played here in Buffalo for a while, but now I'm retired as a, as a pickup basketball player, um, especially with kids, you know, these, these ankles just don't hold up. The highest form of competition now, Jim, is I think a lot of our listeners can probably relate when you're on the, you're on the ride mower and you're working around the trees and you're like, you want to cut, cut back, cut down on your, your weed whacking and you're trimming with the push mower. And so you're, in there. you're trying to cut those corners best you can while you're like horizontal working your way underneath the tree so you don't mm-hmm. get whacked in the eyes uh, by that pine tree. You know, I, I think that there is a, it is a sport, I should say. Mowing is a sport. When done right, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to work your body at all these different angles to limit the trimming after the fact. So that's where I'm at athletically. It's kind of sad depressing actually but it was fun i enjoyed it i look i mean mowing is it's the joy of life at this point i think a lot of people would agree with you um and i think it goes to say if you're working that hard you got to get that mid mow beer like if you're you're mm-hmm. twisting around like that and really trying to dive in <laughs> avoid the trees avoid the branches you got to get a mid right. you got to get a beer to get through it the John Deere gets it done. It becomes like golf. You could you could make mowing just like golf. Make it an event. Have one before you tee off, midway, after. It's a good way to get you right into the right when you're done and keep it flowing. You know, I, I do like listening to Adam Crow, obviously, and working the yeah, podcast. You, yeah. There's a lot of good ones out there. Use it for podcasts for sure. Audio books. Listen to some good books. Uh, Bear Town series. Just finished that up. So good. But sometimes it's just good to listen to music and, and let the mind wander, Cre- get the creative juices flowing. A lot of times, no music. Just take in the, the sights and sounds of the birds, of the other people mowing their lawns. So it's fun. I, it was good to get out there. Mother's Day was great. Um, yeah, it's, it, it just puts you in a good mood. I think people who don't live here don't realize. I mean, we have, if we have listeners in Wisconsin, they get it the seasonal depression out there is real i feel like it didn't warm up until june some of those winters here too. i'll say it like man the four seasons here when it is summer it is done right in buffalo i agree i would agree tyler i agree i what just do we want to talk use about? a little bit more a little bit more of, a little warmer right now but that's all right that's all right yeah, yeah. beautiful beautiful weather all right, so we have a, a series on Kevin Cobb live. Thank you to everybody who has read that. Uh, hope, hoping to get him on the podcast. I think it would be great for you guys to reconnect too. Um, yeah. You and Doug, I mean, you were you didn't bring him in, so Buddy Nix was the general manager. And Doug. That first, Doug. first week of April, they, they signed. And, and Doug was right his right-hand man. So he did. Doug was a part, Doug of that, did, right. part of that, right? I came in. I came in for – yeah, I only saw Kevin really at training camp. And uh, so then that was, I think, April 8th, Cobb was signed. Two weeks later, EJ Manuel is drafted. Buddy Nick says farewell. Doug is promoted. Doug hires you. And the plan was Kevin Cobb is your starting quarterback. And, and, and Kevin was so excited about this offense in 2013. But Nathaniel Hackett, I mean, so that's a lot about Hackett. When I mean, you talk to any of these quarterbacks, any of these players, they, they just say how much they loved playing for Hackett in, in this offense. It was up-tempo, no huddle. Um, he slipped on the rubber mat infamously at St. John Fisher. Thinks, oh, my God, did I tear my damn ACL? I mean, throws his helmet. Uh, it was upset. His his grandmother dies the next day. Uh, he missed eight days of training camp. So he kind of loses, uh, you know, valuable time, like let alone fighting for the job, but just working with the offense. But he, he came back and was the guy, and it was pretty clear, okay, Kevin Cobb is going to start in that Redskins game. That third preseason game was going to be the moment of let's see it all come together on the field. Let's put whiteboard to action. That drive started really, really well. 
moving right down the field, uh, suffers the concussion. It's just a ding to the head. I mean, unless you're looking for it, you wouldn't even notice it. And that was number four. Uh, did definitely would love it if people want to check out the series. Thank you so much for reading. But it's tragic what he went through after the fact. He finished that drive, scored a touchdown. Um, but I thought it really said a lot about Doug Whaley up in the booth to see this, to notice it. I mean, he he saw it. The need, and he called down to the sideline and was like, hey, you know, check in on Kevin. And that's when Nathaniel Hackett approached Kevin Cobb and said, hey, you know, management saw it. Are you okay? Wanted the five minutes. Kind of like getting into the story at this point. But it's my point being in terms of you and Doug Whaley and where the Bills were at in 2013, like right, right when you joined, I mean, the plan was sound. We, we had EJ Manuel on the podcast and you guys talked about it. Like start Kevin Cobb. He's the guy. Bring EJ along slowly. Perfect setup. Going into the season, Kevin Cobb knew if I get another concussion, a fourth concussion, I've got to retire. I'm done. That was the case. It was emotional. He moved on. The symptoms were horrific. His life went down a really, really dark path that he opened up on. His life torpedoes and the 2013 Bills torpedo. It just kind of threw everything haywire. But what what do you remember about that time, Jim? I mean, we'll we'll get into you know the, what we want to talk about on the podcast, but I, we haven't really talked about where the state of the team was then and and what where you were hoping it would go. This is where you separate, where you become so focused when you're in the front office and it's scary because you don't know necessarily, like I didn't know everything that was going on with Kevin, like behind the scenes, as far as grandmother, I didn't even know another concussion. He would, you know, he was going to retire. I, I, cause I wasn't, I'm sure Doug and buddy Nix knew that I wasn't a part of all the, you know, the lead up to signing him. Obviously we all knew him as a player. I think the plan was great looking back on, yeah, if you're going to take a chance on EJ, let him ease into it. Let a veteran guy that it, it would have been nice to see. And EJ talked about that when we had EJ on the pod. I mean, he knew the plan too. I and mean, he was okay with the plan. Hey, I'll compete. But yeah, I don't mind coming in, learning a little bit, trying to figure this thing out, you know, especially as we try to build the, the team the right way and, you know, everything. I just remember thinking for Cobb, like, that was such bad luck between switch, slipping, <laughs> running, jogging between practices. You fall down, get, and then you get hurt in a preseason concussion. That was like you said was wasn't an obvious one to to, to the average, you know, just watching. Obviously, they all there's no such thing as little or bad concussions. They're concussions, and he's done. And I just remember thinking, okay, we got to get EJ in. Let's get another guy. We got to get another veteran in. EJ's probably going to start at this point. We got to make this work. Everybody's got to step up, but you kind of just stay focused and you lose sight of the fact that Kevin Cobb's career just was done. You know, with, he wasn't ready to be done necessarily. I mean, he wanted to play. He was excited for the opportunity and man, it's just going back on it to think, would it have changed anything for EJ Manuel? We don't know. I, I, we always, we go back and look at EJ's rookie year. We've done it a million times. I feel like it wasn't that bad. Now, that being said, I think at the end of the day, I think EJ had enough opportunities to prove himself worthy, you know, for a future. But who knows how that could have helped his development? The Bills, too. You know, for us as well, a new front office, Doug's first time GM. I'm first time director of player personnel. We have a new head coach, first time NFL head coach, Doug Marone. So there's a lot of new things. New first time head coach, first time GM, rookie quarterback. No owner. Like Tyler, we talk about the four things being in place. Oh, for four. We had nothing in place. So it doesn't shock me when I look back on things and like, yeah, it was a struggle because we didn't have anything in place. So I guess I got off a little bit, but it goes to show you how much that injury to Kevin Cobb, the domino effect it has on the plan in place. Now you got to go to plan B, plan C, whatever, whatever it was at that point. But yeah, it was – for you to bring that story back to light is pretty cool because not I maybe mean, cool is the wrong word, but it's deserving for a guy like Kevin Cobb to at least get that story out there. He wanted to play football still. He did. I mean, I think I described him as a murderous competitor. I mean, he, he is was. That's how we always remember him. Like when I, yeah. It, it's so 
And it's wild because from Philly to Arizona to Buffalo, he was the anointed guy. Like he, he, he was the handpicked successor, successor to Donovan McNabb. And then he gets the $63.5 million contract with the Cardinals. And then he's going to start in Buffalo. And each time a concussion just railroaded his career. The Clay Matthews hit in, in game one, start one, 2010. Arizona concussion number two, Brian Arakpo lights him up and he hides it. It's a different time then. Pre-league of denial, old school NFL still, paid a lot of money to be the guy. He didn't want anybody to know right out of the shoot, basically, the second game with Arizona, that he suffered concussion. So he hit it. He didn't, he didn't tell anybody outside of his wife. Trainers didn't know. Coaches didn't know. And they lose six straight games. And it's like, wow, I mean, who's this next Kurt Warner paid all this money struggling? Um, the concussion had a lot to do. I mean, that was concussion number two. He, was, he wasn't the same guy. He wasn't seeing the field the same. was undisciplined. By the time he does turn the corner – that's the scene in Baltimore at the suite about to play the Ravens. And he is literally on his knees praying to God, get me out of this situation. I do not want to play this game. He's looking around his hotel room. He sees seven windows. It's like, I couldn't hit one of these windows with a football if I tried. Um, because mentally he was just a wreck. He was shot. He had no confidence at all. And that's when he said he literally felt like an angel. Pick him up off the bed. And he, he goes, I don't mean to get overly religious here, but when I was praying to God in that moment, the Holy Spirit, something helped me play that football game. And he lit it up that first half. It was unbelievable. And then he tears every ligament in his toe. And Ken, Ken Wisenhunt tells him, you're playing in the second half. Makes it worse. They lose the game. He misses four games. I mean, it was the, the catalytic series of events of Kevin Cobb's career. It's mind-blowing. Uh, and he gets into it to his credit. He doesn't shy from it. And at no point does Kevin Cobb like try steering the conversation in these other directions. It's he'll relive it all. Uh, and I, I want to ask you though, Jim, I mean, really talking to Kevin Cobb, we, we chatted for several hours, several different conversations. And uh, we had the same conversation, I think ourselves on the podcast after Tamar Hamlin nearly dies on a football field. I, I think, we all saw Tua Tunga Viola, his hand locking up, you know, two concussions, possibly three. You know, if you count the Matt Milano, whatever the hell happened against the Bills to start it all. I feel like, and and and, and what Tua went through, that's kind of what compelled me to call Kevin again. And you know, we chatted way back in 2015 for a Buffalo News story. So many of these things happen, and they force us to kind of face our own relationship with the sport. And how do we reconcile? Our love of football, the violence is what it is. I've got many thoughts on it and shared it in this series, but what, where do you stand as somebody who's been in the sport your whole life as well with, okay, this sport is amazing. We love it. It's unique. It takes a certain mentality to step into this realm, which is why I think we're drawn to it because if it was flag, nobody would give a shit. I mean, nobody's, and, and that's not even an anti flag statement, but it's just true. Like if it's flag football and they're not hitting each other and it's like the pro bowl was this past year, nobody cares. Nobody's what we like it because it's not for everybody. You know, it takes a different dude to, to go into that arena, uh, but it comes with consequences. It comes with this darker side for every Patrick Mahomes is on a podium celebrating with Andy Reed. There's Kevin Cobb, coached by Andy Reid, and it, his career goes wrong in every possible way after that. Like for every for every triumph, there's tragedy. There's a yin, there's a yang, and I just I I just wish the NFL would own it. Uh, just just own it, right? Stop referring to <laughs> concussions as as head injuries on these broadcasts. <laughs> like it's like a brain jiggling around in the skull is the same as an ankle sprain. It's you know, real. I just, at every turn, I just feel like the league doesn't really doesn't really own it like this darker side because of uh, <clears throat> perception and, and convincing mom that it's safe. It's not safe and that's okay. But anyways, I don't know. I just, I, I just want honesty all the way around. Players should feel like they can be honest to coaches when they're going through something. Uh, te teams should be honest. 
with players. The league should be honest with the public. That lack of authenticity is what pisses me off. Uh, but I, I, I think that we all have to come to grips with the violence of the sport in our own way. Where do you stand with it all? The DeMar Hamlin tragedy, all that almost tragedy, you know, whatever you want to say about it. But that woke me up to understand when every player said they were just going to keep playing, they know what they're signing up for. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done analyzing it. Cause that night I thought that was going to be, I was done. I mean, you and I talked, I was like, I, I don't know if this, you know, I don't know how you continue playing this sport. This is crazy. It's what you sign up for. Everybody knows it. It's not going to change anything. I think to your point, you'd like to see the NFL maybe just act like they care a little bit, but they don't. The Thursday night games prove it. Go to London. Hey, you have an option. When you come back, do you want to play that week? Now you have an option. I'm going to tell you, I was a part of that London trip. That is, it's tiring. Like, like it really is. Like, you do need, it's nice if you can recover a little bit. But I saw the Bills pick, you know, they chose to play the next week because they go to London early this year, and they pick to play that week and, and take their bye later, which I agree with. But that's tough. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't I don't know if the NFL really embraces and owns. We want to take care of you guys as best we can. I think it's push everybody, keep pushing everybody through, and keep this train rolling. You're right. <laughs> you're right. I mean, because if you're owning the violence as inherent to the sport, then you would do what you can to minimize the long term effects, the impact. And you they are. I mean, they try football but... games. They try but I, it's, it's bs like it's all BS. these flags all BS. these fines they're not going to do anything cop the cops last two concussions well first of all the iraq bull pit hit the matthew said those were legal in any nfl but even the next two ahmad brooks for the 49ers hustling to the a loose fumble hits him in the head and a player for the redskins who had all of two tackles in his nfl career He's just hustling downfield and inadvertently dings him in the head with his knee. So, and to a tongue of Viola, he's just falling down. I mean, he's trying to learn jujitsu to try to fall more gracefully. What are you going to do? Mandate jujitsu across the league? Uh, that, make that every play I hate that argument. You just have to accept that it's part, no. concussions are part of the game. Okay, let's accept it. That's sad, but true. Especially in the true. line of scrimmage where the sub-concussive hits are going to be every play. So do what you can as a league to deal with it. Eliminate Thursday night football. Eliminate the preseason. Just get rid of all the exhibition games. Um, that's That was the fourth for Cobb, right? It was an exhibition game. D- do what you can within the reality that you exist to help these guys. And guess what? When they're done playing, maybe, maybe give a shit. Maybe care about these guys. Maybe these NFL appointed doctors who are reviewing retirees, you know, don't give them, don't give these players the run around. It, it, you hear it again and again and again. Don Mikowski, he, he kind of opened our eyes to it. And then Kevin Cobb here where he said, um, you know, he's like, look, I didn't even want, the, he doesn't need the money. He made enough money, you know, thankfully for him and his family, the contract he got from Arizona, but the sport did, do damage to his brain. That's why he retired. So he did seek permanent disability. And he went to a doctor. I mean, he went to several doctors. But he went to one doctor, and he's looking at his legs. He's looking at his arms. He's looking at his chest because he had the sternum. And Kevin's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's my head, guys. It's my brain. That's where the concussions. And the doctor said, well, how did you get here? And he's like, well, I flew. I flew in a plane. And the doctor said, well, then you're fine if you're in a plane. <laughs> Let alone the fact that somebody else booked him this flight. For a, week, for a week straight, he was jacked up from that flight. Being in a plane did do damage to Kevin Cobb. So then he said, all right, I'm just going to drive to my next appointment in Houston. Drives the eight-hour round trip from where he lives in Texas to Houston. And the doctor there says, well, you know, if you were able to drive, then, then you should be fine. And then at that point, he threw his arms up and he said, you know what? I don't know what game you're trying to play NFL, but you're not going to play with my brain. So he's, he's kind of figuring out on, on his own. And I don't think he's alone. I think so many players go through this. So if you care, 
NFL change this because this is it's, it's BS. They, the players who made this game, they shouldn't be. You shouldn't be calling them liars. Basically, you're you're pointing these doctors, and you're and you're 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 saying that these guys are lying to you, which isn't right. Well, you don't want to put the players in a position to to have to question anything, the care that they're getting. You know, what I mean, you don't want the player to have to question any type of evaluation that a doctor is giving them. They, that's the last thing they need to worry about. They have enough to worry about. I, Tyler. I think we've beat it down pretty good as far as you and I over these podcasts. It's not going to change. Um, it's only going to get – there's going to be games on Wednesdays if possible, Tuesdays if possible. It's all going to happen. You're going to see it. The NFL is going to – they'll they'll PR it. You know, they'll have some statement how they still care. They don't. We know that. It's about the money and the ratings. Players are getting compensated for the money that the NFL makes. I mean, I don't know what else to say other than it's a dangerous sport. They know what they're signing up for. We can say everything. We can talk about it. I think, Tyler, what scares me about football, we're talking about the NFL and concussions. So they have the means to do it, the, to take care of the players the best they can. But the sport doesn't change trickling down Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three colleges to high school. Concussions are the same. They don't have the medical help that the NFL has. So if the NFL struggles with the, these diagnoses and, and how they're analyzing concussions and think about what's going on for everybody playing football at every level that doesn't have the top care, you know what you're signing up for. There's going to be head trauma involved in football. I don't know how else to say it. Exactly. Exactly. So educate. Educate. More than you're educating. I don't know what else to say. More than you're helping the former players start it young. You know, I mean, it's bigger than the NFL. You're right. It starts at youth football and high school. But I think everybody still kind of takes their cue from the NFL in terms of how do we deal with this issue that's inherent to the sport. So are they qualified? That's a responsibility. No doubt. I mean, are they qualified, though? Is everybody qualified enough to – I, that's the stuff I don't know, but I, I think at this point, you know what you're signing up for if you want to play football. Yeah. And so, and once you know the risk, and, and we're in a much better place here in 2023 than even Kevin Cobb was in 2013 when his, his career ended in 2011 when he feels like he needs to hide a concussion uh, from the team. And he felt, quote unquote, trapped because it's like you can't say anything because once you start playing games, you can't really say anything because now they would say, oh, you're just saying that because you're playing like shit, right? Like what, what, why, why would you bring this up? Oh, so like, that's why he felt like he couldn't say anything. So we're in a better place now than we were 10, 11, 12 years ago. But I, I think that's the only answer is for everybody to kind of know what the sport can do to you. And then you've got the free will to play in the, to, to play football or not, which is what makes this country great. Uh, we were talking about it before we hit record, but man, the book again, or uh, I'm sorry, Across the River by my buddy Ken Babb is one of the best sports books I've ever read in my life about Edna Carr High School down in the New Orleans area. And it, it is a matter of life and death for all these 16, 17, and 18 year old kids. And football is such a saving grace. Bryce Brown, the head coach down there, is, is saving lives. I mean, football is, it, it's, a, it's a means out. It, it's, it's showing you a different world. I mean, they take trips uh, to colleges to practice and and you just, you can see, Oh, there is a world outside of this gun violence that I'm seeing every day. Football, it it brings so much good to society. We can't lose sight of that. Uh, And that's kind of how I justified it out of the DeMar Hamlin stuff. I mean, DeMar Hamlin is, and granted his, what, what led to his cardiac arrest was even bigger than football. I mean, with a really rare disease, but where he comes from, McKees Rocks, when more than half of the kids he grew up with are dead, and now you can be a, a shining light for kids in that same neighborhood, that's a story you see across the country, all over the place. So I've got no problem with football. I mean, I think football is – I know it made us as human beings and it, as men. Like, I don't know where I'd be, you know, my value system and the lessons that the sport taught without, without football. Lessons. 
So by is this an attack of the sport itself? It's an attack on how the NFL's handling its own reality. So I don't know. I, I, I you know, you know what's crazy? You don't really hear much conversation about concussions like you did it's just a decade ago. You know, it's when League of Denial came out. It's I, I, maybe I'm cynical and it's a little cryptic. I feel like the NFL kind of likes the fact that we that that, that that we moved on to kneeling and Dan Snyder shenanigans and my offense tampering and um, COVID and racism in America because in their mind that stuff is is fixable from a PR standpoint right just just paint and racism in the end zone and voila no more racism there you go or you know push Dan Snyder out take away a first round draft pick from the Dolphins um hey you don't want to get the vaccine all right wear, wear a mask at the podium like the NFL they, I think that's how they think in Park Avenue what from a PR standpoint, what can be fixed? You can't fix concussions. They will keep happening. Right? You can call a head injury all you want during the broadcast. They're going to happen. There's going to be more Kevin Cobbs. Uh, so I think that's why they almost kind of like it that it hasn't been the headlines. And I think it's a disservice by us in sports media to – we shouldn't be ignoring an issue that is much bigger, in my opinion, than – all the above that is listed off. I think head trauma in the sport and how the NFL deals with it mm-hmm. is a hell of a lot more important, you know, than other stuff that we waste mm-hmm. oxygen on. I don't know. I'm I think it's the only thing that can, head. yeah, I think concussions is the only thing that can derail it. I mean, you know, the medical thing is really the only thing that could derail the NFL trade. And I don't, it's to your point, they've done a great job of almost pushing it. We, we still talk about it, but not, you're right, not nearly. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about with Kevin Cobb a lot too, as a player, because, you know, you brought him back to life a little bit in my mind. Who do you compare? Like, is he comparable to like a Derek Carr as far as, is that a good comparison in your mind when you hear that as far as a good, really good passing quarterback? Um, I'm not sure you would consider him, you know, like when we say franchise, I hate to use that all the time, but you wouldn't put him in that top. He's your number one. You can win a Super Bowl with him tomorrow type quarterback, but he's tough. He's good. Like, you know, it's like, I always feel like Carr is a good quarterback, but not a great quarterback. And that's how I always thought about Kevin Cobb. Good yeah. quarterback, not great. I think so, but you know what's kind of sad is we never really got to see. We didn't I mean, really see, and that's why I didn't want to be. I didn't want to like. I didn't want to like make it unfair to Cobb because we didn't see all of it. Yeah. I, you know, when it comes to the actual quarterbacking aspect of of the Kevin Cobb story, I mean, right? He he waited three years uh, behind Donovan McNabb. It was mm-hmm. a controversial pick. At, controversial pick at the time. You you can find the reaction. On YouTube, I mean, they blew the hell up. Similar times, you know, at the NFL draft when Kevin Cobb was drafted in uh, 07, then, you know, having 312,000 people in Kansas City, Missouri, when you just have, you know, a few dozen just mercilessly booing a pick instead of, uh, you know, a, a, a Canadian social media influencer making picks for the Buffalo Bills. Like, get, get the hell out of here. That, that, was, that was ridiculous. The draft. I mean, I kind of – but so he waits three years, um, finally gets his shot, right? So Andy Reid, I mean, he was his handpicked guy out of Houston, I think like 36 overall at the top of the second round. Finally plays, starts a Super Bowl ready roster. Uh, I think they were just off the NFC Championship game a couple of years before Cobb took over, right? When they lost to Arizona with Warner. So that was Cobb's team. Um, Man, I mean, just rewatching a lot of these games for the stories. I mean, that that place was jacked. Lincoln Financial Field when Cobb took the field against the Green Bay Packers. The Packers had the number one defense in 09. Started a little iffy that first quarter. I think it was just three three. Neither team could really get their footing. And to this day, he still is. Like, Why do I think I can, you know, outrun Clay Matthews? But he took off, hesitated just a bit, and that's when Matthews pile drove him. So. 
That's what opened the door to Michael Vick, that first concussion. Vick obviously sets the league ablaze after spending two plus years in prison uh, for the dog fighting ring. You can't take him off the field at that point. Vic, Vic actually got hurt in the middle of the season. Cobb came in, had a hell of a game against Atlanta. 300 some yards, three touchdowns, no picks, 21 to 26. But it was still Vic's team because he had played so well. Then the lockout happens after that. So Cobb's thinking, am I even going to get paid? Am I going to get traded? Where, where, where is this going? Vic got a big deal. And that's when he goes to Arizona. That's when he has concussion number two. That's when he hides it. That's when they have a six-game losing streak. Uh, the, the, the Ravens game, that you know, tears up his, his foot, misses a little action. But when he came back, he kind of thought in his head, I figured out how to play quarterback. Look, the defense was playing better for Arizona with John Skelton. And he's like, I don't – if I just play a little more discipline, play within myself, we've got a real shot here. And they had an overtime win against Dallas that was exciting as hell. Through the game, winning touchdown in overtime. What happens the next game? Concussion number three. <laughs> it's San Francisco. I mean, literally the, the, the second play of the game. And that's when he just had to shut it down. He couldn't hide it anymore. Traveled with the team to Cincinnati. Was in and out of the locker room because he just he couldn't handle the noise and the bright lights. He's putting earplugs in, his sunglasses on. Um, it was that off season when he was honest with the team and said, like, one more and I'm done. Didn't have a concussion in 2012, but that's when he broke his sternum against the Bills. But played so well that game. I think it stood out to Buddy Nix and Russ Brandon and Doug and into the next off season. Um, gets signed by the Bills and then we all know what happened. So to answer your question, I feel genuinely like there were a few different times where Kevin Cobb was turning the corner as a player. More to come. Right? And playing pretty well. Uh, tough, a big arm, uh, but he just couldn't shake the injuries. And it was really that slipping on the mat that I think drove Kevin mad more than anything, that injury, because that, that was the one it's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like I'm slipping on a mat, uh, and twists up his knee and his kneecap damage came back with the brace. But granted, he came back in time, was ready to be the guy, and then had the fourth concussion. You know, he made a point at one time toward the end of our, our chats where it's like, look, that is when I slip on a damn mat, like when I, you know, going drill to drill, he goes, maybe that's God telling me. He goes, I don't want to blame God because he is obviously really spiritual now, but maybe that's sure. God telling me football isn't for you, dude. Like, five, yeah. I mean, regardless. It would go through anything's going to go through your mind if that's how you're getting injured. All the work you do and all the training you do to play the sport, and you're just jogging to another. It's I, I would feel the same way. I mean, what do I have to do to play? Yeah. If I can't jog to a, a next drill in practice without slipping. Man. Anyway, and and then this is where people should go through the archives and I'll link it here, but listen to your chat with EJ Manuel on the pod because EJ was the first to say kind of like, I think he was ready to just kind of sit and learn. And to your point, I, I don't know if anything's different. I really don't. I mean, we saw enough either. of EJ Manuel. But I'm not, yeah, that wasn't my point. It, right. We don't have to, it's, it's not to say EJ, it's not to say that was going to solve the problem for EJ or whatever it was, help EJ develop. It may have, it may have not. I personally, yeah. But regardless, it wasn't the plan. That was the plan to max out EJ's ability. You know, let him learn a little, so. Yeah. Exactly. All right, well, we, we were going to talk about, you know, the NFC and it being wide open and Isaiah McKenzie on the, on the happy hour comparing Brian Dable's offense to Ken Dorsey's offense and where the bills are going here in the off season, but you know, it's a long off season. We're going to have time to, to get into all this. So thanks for indulging me, Jim. I just, I wanted to get your perspective on, you know, pain, concussions, injuries, NFL, watching this stuff. I think Kevin Cobb is a rarity in being willing uh, to kind of bear his soul with the public and what he's been through. Cause there's, there, there's a lot more like him. I mean, he's in a good place now, but as he said, at 1130 at night, he'll get calls from, other players around the NFL balling their, their eyes out in a dark locked room away from their families. Uh, there, there's a darker side to the NFL that people aren't really seeing here. That would be, the, that would be it. 
the guys that are just battling that scary brain injury that we can't even relate to. You know, I can't relate to that. That's got to be terrifying for those guys. Do you know of guys, you know, without mentioning names that are going through some hard times right now, like Kevin? Like Kevin I'll bring up a guy from your book, Jimmy Graham. The other day, um, got hit by, do you see he was in a, he got hit riding his bike. He got, Jimmy Graham was riding his bike in Miami and got hit by a car. Now he's okay. But I think about Jimmy, I've always thought a lot about with Jimmy Graham. When I read that, I was like, he I think you, he told you this too, but he flies planes as well. Yeah. So he has this, and I don't, I'm not saying this is anything. I'm not trying to say this is from an injury or anything, but Jimmy Graham has this some, and I'm not saying Jimmy, but football players in general, guys that play this sport, it's a high adrenaline contact. You know, you're always on, you're always on. When you have downtime, can you relax? If your downtime is flying a plane or riding a bike in traffic in South beach, you, that's not downtime to me. Like downtime to me is I'm on a beach. I'm not getting injured. Like, I promise you, I'm not moving much. If my job was to be a professional athlete, my downtime isn't flying a plane or riding a bike. So I think to my, I don't know. I'm not saying it's up in his head, but these guys are wired. We've always said it wired differently. They, they have a, it's a tough time for them to turn off. So I don't know if that plays a part in it, but it, Jimmy, it made me think of that with Jimmy Graham the other day. I'm like, why is he even, you know, it's, I don't even know the whole story, but it's like, why even ride a bike in in South Beach? Like, anyway, I'm really, I'm really glad you brought that up. I mean, that's that's a really good point. Kevin said he was just talking to Case Keenum this past year. They're buddies. They do some business together. Um, obviously, Keenum, the backup quarterback, now with the Bills. They both went to Houston, different time periods. And he goes, I he goes, I was telling Case like the NFL lifestyle is exaggerated. The highs are so high, the lows are so low, so low. Millions of people are watching your every move. It's almost like a real life Truman show. And it's, it's exaggerated for good and bad. I mean, you win a Super Bowl, the euphoria and the joy and the money and the, the fame that comes with that. It's not normal. And if you're struggling and you drop a pass with everything on the line and the backlash and the hate, especially now with social media and the financial ramifications and the fact that you could just get dressed kicked to the street. That low is very, very low. And he said, look, the way to live is to kind of stretch that out and, and, and not get high, not get low. That's why you know, he's had opportunities. Um, he wouldn't say which team or which coach it was. I think he can kind of put two and two together. Um, but he had a chance to coach an elite quarterback, he said, in 2019, and he turned it down. And then he had a chance to work on a TV network to talk about football and turn it down. He, he he just kind of wants to stay as a serial entrepreneur, stay competitive. And he has four mm. autism clinics. He's yeah, I get got that. four girls that he's raising, ranch girls that can shoot bow and arrow and gun and do all that. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to live that exaggerated life. He's like, a part of the, I, I, do, I want to bring my kids along for a Super Bowl ride. That'd be fun. And part of like, you know what? I, this is a better way to live. You know, he's a, obviously a devout Christian and, you know, he's works at his ministry at his church too. To each their own, right? I think there are probably more Jimmy Grahams that need the thrill. <laughs> they, they, they have to, like, tap into that inner, very primitive, wild beast. Uh, and it's hard to just get ejected into a normal – I mean, that, that's what makes it hard. I mean, guys aren't ready for that stretched out, non-exaggerated, non-NFL lifestyle. And that's where the NFL probably could step in, too, and help players out. Like help that transition. It's I, I struggle making that war analogy because nothing's like war. But Darren College, I mean, he served a former Packer, former Cardinal, former teammate of Cobbs. He's been in the military. He was in the NFL for nine years. He works at Boise State, his alma mater now. And he's like, there's so many similarities in in, in uh, transitioning from one life to the next. Lee Smith said the same thing. Like there's it's a reason you see a lot of homeless vets. He's got you're not ready for this new life. So we, we probably need more help in that realm too. You know, once these vets come home and they're trying to transition and the NFL could do its part. So that's probably the theme of this episode, right? Like, let's, let's see the NFL step up, just help own your reality and then help guys within that reality. 
I think I think that's what we would like to see as fans of the sport and and people like you and I. We we love football. We respect the sport, and we'd like to see them do everything they can to take care of the players because that's the players make the game. But I think the reality is nothing's going to stop this thing. You're right. You're right. Who would have thought they would be uh, kind of wrapping their warm and loving arms around gambling apps, you know, even five years ago. And then out of one side here. And I hate it now. I hate those gambling app commercials this time of year. It's going to get even worse. Wait till football gets close. Wait till the influx of gambling, the, the sign up commercials. Hey, 1500, you know, 1500 deposit, you get free bet. It, it's so bad what they do to get you in. But guess who else embraces it? The NFL. So the NFL loves it. Stadiums are named after Caesar sports books and whoever FanDuel. Oh my God. But, so that's what I'm trying to say. I think we can we can talk about and recognize the problems or the scary things that are going on. Nothing's changing. Full throttle. Train yeah. is moving. It is. It's Ethan Strauss at the House of Strauss has an excellent sports substack if people want to check it out. Uh, but he made this point. He's like that that Charles Barkley commercial for a gambling app. I don't know what it. Maybe it's FanDuel. I saw it. Their, their point is like gamble like a pro. Well, you. You can't gamble as a pro because then you will be suspended like everybody that just was in the NFL. <laughs> I mean, the hypocrisy is in, it's in clear sight, clear day. The, what people don't understand, the, the rules are so confusing to the players. All those, all the guys that got in trouble in Detroit, they, they honestly, they're, they're confused. I mean, you're yeah. allowed to bet. You're allowed to bet on other sports. Just don't do it from the facility. You know, it's, it's very simple. It's not that hard. You don't need to get in trouble. But blah, blah, blah. Like, exactly. It's kind yes. of like the, uh, you know, the COVID protocols. I think it rightfully kind of pissed off some, not just players, but everybody's society. It's like, what, what can you do and when? Right? Like you're on the airplane and, okay, I, I have to wear a mask, but if I'm going to eat this bag of pretzels you just gave me, I can, I can pull the mask down, eat the pretzel, but then I got to put the mask right back up. Like, what, are, what, are, what are we doing here? Let's just be consistent. All right, that's a that's a good spot to end. We got to get L off to pre preschool gym. No, I like this though, the Tyler. That was good to, to um, this was fun to to at least revisit and yep. and make aware of a guy players who their careers get derailed from concussion. We kind of forget about how his his career was on track to be to be the Derek Carr to be that type of guy. Never never could stay healthy. Battle battle battle. Through, you know, his life is about, it's scary. It's good to bring it to life to let people know that just because he goes away and retires, his life wasn't necessarily easy when he retired. I mean, he had to battle, he had to battle a lot mentally and it's pretty frightening. I mean, Kevin Cobb is the story of pro football as much as Mahomes, Allen, Burrow, insert star here. And we shouldn't forget it. If we're watching this product, if we're supporting this product, I feel like we've got to, Write about and discuss the other side of the spectrum. Agreed. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and reading the series. Um, The response has been great. So thanks so much for checking that out. I'm Kevin Cobb. We've got a lot of trips coming up at the newsletter. I'll be uh, hitting some mini camps up, OTAs, and we'll, we'll keep this podcast humming here. So Fatty Beer Company, they fuel us. Be there. We'll let you know when we're going to have a live event again. Let's do it.